I like watching movies. I like uh, older movies, some of the black and white. Uh, I like newer movies, just a variety of movies. One of my favorites, uh, it's a classic, is The Wizard of Oz. And in my opinion, uh, The Scarecrow is probably one of the greatest fictional, not that I take that back, I think he is the greatest fictional character of all time. You know why Scarecrow from The Wizard of Oz is the greatest fictional character? Nobody can hold a candle to him. <laughs> fellow was doing an evaluation of the company where he worked. He was in IT, and so he had to make sure everybody's password was secure. He went through everybody's, and some were fairly good, and some were, were fairly poor. Uh, but there was one person that it stood out about everyone else. It was the longest, most secure password. He just couldn't break it with any of his encryption software. So he went to the fellow, and he asked him afterwards. He said, uh, how is it that you have such a secure password? He said, uh, you got to tell me, first of all, well, what is it? Because everybody's got to reset their name. What is it? He said, well, he said, it's Luke, Leia, Han Solo, Bubba Fett, Darth Vader, Yoda, Washington, D.C. And the IT guy says, wow, that, that's, that's, yeah, that's a really long password. It's very secure. He said, I get all the Star Wars stuff. He said, but what's the, the deal with Washington, D.C.? He said, well, it's really simple. Just follow the directions. He said, when it asked me to pick out a password, it says six characters and a capital. <laughs> I'd like to talk about the subject character today. I would like to talk specifically about the subject of God's character, of God's character. We, some of us perhaps years ago, remember receiving a booklet entitled, God Is. And it was a booklet that wound up talking about the nature of God and it introduced the, the idea or the thought that God was a trinity, which of course we know and understand it isn't true and that was in a former organization and that was sort of the impetus for a lot of us to, to uh, move on from there. But I'm not talking about that sort of character. I'm not talking about his nature, whether he's spirit or human or anything like that. I'm talking about his character as a, I say person, as a being. What's his character like? When I mean character, I mean things like when you, you meet a person, sometimes you say, well, that's a good-natured character. That's a good-natured character. They're calm. They're peaceable. Maybe sometimes you might say something like, someone brings a, a positive energy to the team. I'm not talking about energy like, you know, healing crystals and auras and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about, you know, in a workplace situation, somebody who's got a real go-getter sort of attitude, and, and they really help get things done. If we were to sit down and, and fill out a personality profile, so to speak, for God, what would it look like? Now, let me just say, we're not here to evaluate, per se, or critique God's character. It's not like we're filling out you know, his, his profile on, on a dating app, uh, which reminds me. You ever read uh, what Delilah's profile was? You know, Samson and... Profile, it says, Philistine and feisty, attracted to strong men, aspiring to be a hairdresser. <laughs> no, we're not talking about that sort of reason, but why would we want to evaluate God's character? Well, the simple answer is this. The better we understand God's character, the better we can emulate it. The better we understand God's character, the better we understand how to have godly character. I feel like titles, I've just entitled this message, The Character of God, and I want us to better understand how to have godly character. And we're going to do that by examining the character of God. How do you even start? How do you even start to examine the character of God? I thought, well, the most obvious difference between God and us, he's spirit, or flesh. That's, you know, just a whole different realm, of course. Now, that doesn't tell us much about his character per se, but when we couple the fact that God is spirit and that he shares with us his spirit, I think we can look at the spirit of God, specifically, 
the fruit of the Spirit of God, as an outline for what God's character is. So let's begin in Galatians 5, verse 22. Very familiar scripture, I'm sure, to all of us. Galatians 5, and verse 22. <clears throat> Here we read about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. After going through and comparing some of the the, uh, nature or the works of the flesh, here Paul gets into what the fruit of the Spirit is. Galatians 5, verse 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, oftentimes we say patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now you might be able to come up with other things, other ways to describe the character of God, but for the purposes of today's message, we'll be using the fruit of the Spirit to examine and understand better how we can have the character that God has. There are, as you no doubt know, nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. I would also point out that uh, you've probably heard in sermons these, uh, it's not referred to as fruits of the Spirit. You might consider this as like a clump of grapes with nine grapes or maybe a, an orange. You know, it's one fruit. You open it up and it's got nine little sections, but it's all, it's an inclusive thing. God doesn't just sometimes have this aspect of character and sometimes that. He has all of them all the time. And that's what we should strive for as well. So we'll be going through these a little bit of rapid fire. I want to try not to spend a lot of time defining each of the words. Rather, I'd rather spend a little more time seeing how God demonstrates these different aspects of the fruit of the Spirit and how we can do the same. So let's begin with this first characteristic of God, and that is love. Now, when I say God is love, what's the first thing that comes to mind? First, or first John 4, actually, is this what I was uh, thinking of. Let's go to First John 4. We'll reference John 3.16 here in just a moment. 1 John 4, verse 7. 1 John 4 and verse 7. It says, Behold, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God, by biblical definition, is love. If we were forced to summarize a character, the nature of God, in one word, it would be love. It would be love. Verse 9. <clears throat> It says, in this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And John 3.16 was mentioned. Now, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so we could have eternal life. Not just a physical life, but eternal life. Life free of COVID. Life free of worry about the rent. Life free of you name it. Anything that might cause us stress and worry. That's the kind of life that God's love gives us. Continuing in verse 10. It says, In this love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So here in one verse, we see not only how God demonstrated love by giving his only begotten son. But we see how we should demonstrate love by giving that same sort of love towards one another. It's pretty easy to do at Sabbath services with brethren once a week. It's a little hard to do at home with the wife and kids or on the road with a complete stranger, isn't it? It gets a little more challenging when you're late running out the door or on your way to work or school, someone leaves dirty dishes in the sink or the bike in the yard, you name it. It gets a little harder to practice love, doesn't it? Yet God shows us love. Even when we do things wrong, there might be consequences and you might be firm in administering those consequences. But the overwhelming care and concern that is godly love doesn't go away. The same 
should be true for us. People aggravate us. They annoy us sometimes. But our love and concern for them, the way God loves us, whether they believe as we do, whether they behave perfectly or not, should not change. That must be at our core of how we deal with one another and at the core of our character. The second characteristic we see of God and the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Is joy. Now you'd think this would be an easy one, right? It's a lot harder than it looks sometimes. Let's turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, if you would, and we'll begin in verse 9. John 15, verse 9, says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. And one of the things I will mention today, we will be looking at various examples, some from that of Jesus Christ, some from that of God the Father. But we know they are one in terms of their character. God says, My Father loved me. Abide in this love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. There is, of course, an element of obedience required on our part. You know, we can't just say we love Jesus. We can't just say be you warm and filled and, and keep on walking down the street. No, we do have to understand and obey God. John 4.24 tells us we must worship him in spirit and truth. It's not spirit or truth or something close to truth or a, a version of truth that you find palatable. It says worship him in spirit and truth. So there's certainly an element of obedience Verse 11 it says, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. These are some of Christ's final words on earth to his closest disciples, knowing that in a few hours he was going to be murdered. There, there's no other really word for it. He was murdered. It was a kangaroo court execution. And yes, it had to happen. And we're grateful for his death. But he was murdered, and Jesus Christ knew that was going to happen. But he said, let this joy that I have remain in you. This shows us the true definition of joy. Joy is not something that is tied to our physical circumstances. Joy is not something that is tied to our physical circumstances. Rather, it's connected to our spiritual circumstances, particularly in relation to how closely our character matches the character of God. Verse 12, it says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Wow. We go right back to that first aspect, don't we? And we'll see that as we go along. So many of these aspects of the fruit of the Spirit build off of one another from one to the next. By actively practicing the first attribute characteristic of God, we can work towards the next one. If we continue a little bit further ahead in John chapter 17, John 17, this is what could most rightfully be called the Lord's Prayer. You know, sometimes we, we you hear, read the model prayer and people call that the Lord's Prayer. This would be, I believe, more appropriately, the Lord's Prayer. This is his final Prayer for his disciples before he would die. He was about ready to leave his body in this world behind, and so he's commissioning his disciples here. In John 17, verse 13, it says, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have uh, my joy fulfilled in them. You know, Christ said earlier in John 15, he said, I want to have my joy in you. He says again, he says, here's how you can have my joy in you. And I'm saying this so you may have that joy in you. He says, I have given them your word. He's talking to the Father about his disciples, and by extension, he's talking to us. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. It's mentioned in the sermonette. Paul says, I am convinced that death, sorrow, none of that matters. And the question was asked, are we convinced? Jesus Christ says, I am not of the world. 
am I? Are you? He says, the world hated you. In other words, your circumstances, your physical circumstances, aren't going to be pleasant. We talked a lot about that last week when we talked about Jacob's trouble. Jesus Christ is leaving his disciples in a world that hated them. He says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. God didn't, uh, Jesus didn't pray that we would be removed from a scenario where people hate us. He didn't pray that our physical circumstances just be hunky-dory. He said, I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. So he does pray for our safety, in spiritual sense certainly, the evil one being Satan. He says, I would pray that you would keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Again, Christ points out the world is going to hate you. The world is going to hate you. Don't look for joy in physical things. We have pleasure in physical things. Nothing wrong with enjoying an ice cream cone, a nice day on the lake, you know, whatever. That's fine. But, you know, real joy, deep-seated joy, is not tied to our physical circumstances. It's spiritual. So how do we reflect this godly characteristic? How do we reflect this godly characteristic when earthly pleasure is absent, and even when earthly pressure, uh, pleasure is present, look for spiritual joy. When you hear of innocence dying, think of the joy of God's plan of salvation for all those who have ever lived, who want to have an opportunity to be a part of the God family. When life seems empty and hollow, or even when life seems good, when we think we're able to stand, as we heard earlier, when life seems empty and hollow, think about how God has brought you joy in various ways over the years, and think about how God may have used you to bring joy to other people. That's an important one, and one we often overlook. When the news is sad and depressing, think about the joy of having God's word. Think about the opportunities that we have to glorify God's name, how we live in spite of our physical circumstances. That can give us joy knowing that we bring honor and glory to God. Physical circumstances do not dictate joy. Our attitude in spite of the circumstances, oftentimes does. Don't be of the world. Be of the joy of God. Reflect his joy. The third characteristic as we go forward here is peace. Peace. Let's turn over to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Starting in verse 6. Philippians 4, verse 6. It says, be anxious for nothing. Has anybody been anxious? Past week? Past month? Past year? Past 50 years? Yeah, we can all put our hands up, right? It says, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God. Uh, be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Too often, and I've shared this story once, so I've shared it probably a million more times, too often I skip over that part in verse 6 where it says, with thanksgiving, I go to God with the things I'm anxious about. I don't have any problem at all doing that. God, I'm worried about this. Please help me with A. God, I'm worried about this. Please help me with B. Help me with C. Help me with D. Blah, 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 blah. He does. All too often, though, I forget to say, thank you. Thank you, God. I prayed about A, and you helped me with A. And I find that when I'm not thankful, that's when the anxiety, that's when the worry really starts to build. But when we do do that, what does it say? It says the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Jesus. 
I want to know when COVID is going to end. I want to know what the, the value of my property is going to be 10 years from now. I want to know, do I have any health trials on the horizon? But I don't know. I don't know any of those things. But what's better than knowing? What's better than having any understanding? What's better than having any understanding of prophecy? Is having peace. We're told we can have that peace. We're told that if we follow God's guidelines to be more like him, to have his character, we can have peace. It continues in verse 8. It says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul points out, concentrate on the good. All the good, not just the good that we think we see. You know, the good that I think I see is, is that, you know, I'm going to make X amount of dollars. That's the good, right? But there's other good things besides a bank account. There's other good things besides health. There's beautiful flowers to look at. As a guy, that's not one of the things that I immediately run to, to think about. To think, wow, look how beautiful these flowers are. But when I stop and I appreciate them and I think about them, and I think that's a beautiful thing that God created that someone offered and brought here for us to have. When I think about those things, you begin to see God's character and understand it a little bit more from a big picture perspective. And we can begin to have peace. On the contrary, when I look at statistics about COVID, about abortions, about the number of nukes the Russians have, you name it. <laughs> There's no statistics that are going to make me really feel better. Even if those numbers go down and they say, well, you know, these guys have this many nukes, but listen, we got these many more. You know, that's not really <laughs> the most encouraging and peaceful thing, is it? God is the God of peace. Something that's very important to remember. And it's important to remember that's a part of his character. So the question becomes, how can we take that on? What can you and I do to be givers of peace to other people? Christ said, blessed are the peacemakers. What can we do to be peacemakers? Now, I can't do anything about the number of COVID cases, the number of abortions, all that sort of thing. But you know what I can do? I can share with you a personal story. I can share with you how God encouraged me this week. How in spite of all the world falling down around me, something happened and I had that experience, that still small voice that I said, you know, I know God is there. And he gave me peace. We can share those stories with one another. If you can't think of a story where God gave you peace, ask someone. Ask one of the hoary heads. They've probably got a few. But they'd be more than happy to share with us. While we look to God to grant us peace, let's not forget our ability, our responsibility, to share, to grow peace with one another. Next up is long-suffering or patience. We often say long suffering and patience. Let's turn to First Timothy chapter one. First Timothy chapter one, verse fifteen. First Timothy chapter one and verse fifteen says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. It's a faithful saying. Christ came to save sinners. And Paul says, you know, I'm no exception here. I'm, I'm chief. It says, however, for this reason I obtained mercy, 
that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. You know, Paul recognized that before he could be used to preach the gospel, and Paul preached the gospel in a powerful way, in a unique way that only someone with his life experiences, his past could teach. He said, you know, before that could happen, he recognized that Jesus Christ had to be patient with him first. He recognized that Jesus Christ had to be patient with him. And he's patient with us. He grants us life everlasting through mercy and a lot of patience on his part. I think about Christ in this regard as well. You know, in Hebrews 12, we see the phrase, he endured the cross. He endured the cross. Now, we endure a long, boring sermon. We endure, you know, a, a movie that we paid too much for, and we get halfway through it, and we say, this is garbage. <laughs> and we haven't had to endure death on the cross. Jesus Christ patiently endured. Had a legion of angels at his disposal if he wanted them. But patiently, he fulfilled the role that only he could fulfill for our sakes. So there's no doubt God and Christ have patience, long-suffering with us. What can we do to have more long-suffering, more patience with others? Let's turn over a book to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll read the first two verses. 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. It says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead as is appearing in his kingdom. That's a little bit of a reminder. Paul sticks in here and says, by the way, <laughs> you are going to be judged on how you live, what you do now. It says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. So Paul is giving some specific instruction to Timothy, who was to go, who was a pastor, an evangelist who was to go and teach. But notice one of the things he tells them. He says, convince. And you're going to have to be able to teach people and show them things. Jesus Christ, he was the Son of God. You know, it takes some convincing. Rebuke, he's going to have to correct at times. Exhort, you know, those who maybe know and understand, but, but maybe have just kind of fallen into complacency. He's telling Timothy, you're going to have to exhort them to, yeah, keep on fighting the good fight. Exhort, and he said, with all long suffering. He says, with patience, you're going to have to do this. You know what that tells me? Patience isn't something that we need to go get when things get difficult. Patience, to use a toolbox analogy, is a tool we already need to have. Long suffering is something we need before we have to use it. Now that may sound really obvious. But think about that. What happens typically when we lose patience, right? Most of us have a degree of patience. A little bit. Maybe a little more. But what happens when it runs out, it runs out. And we tend to, you know, bite, snap, do whatever. You know what that means? What that tells me, going back to the, the tool analogy, uh, I needed a little more in my toolbox before I started this job. <laughs> Patience is something we need to ask God for. They could say that of all of these different character attributes. But patience is particularly one. That we need to have a mindset that says, I am going to be patient. You know, whether I'm teaching a kid to bake cookies or, or teaching my wife to drive stick or <laughs> trying to help somebody understand a, a biblical doctrine or whatever. We have to have a mindset, I will have patience. And we have to ask God for that help before a task or before a person tests our patience. We need to stop and think about how Jesus Christ and God have been patient with us 
and ask to have that godlike, that Christ-like patience every day. This gets us to our halfway point, brings us up to kindness. Kindness and goodness, the next two, can sometimes be a little bit uh, confusing in people's minds. And I've heard a variety of sermons over the years, I'm sure you have, talking about what we know the differences between kindness and goodness and, and different definitions. The basic definition that I have come up with is that kindness seems to deal more with a specific action. Kindness seems to deal with more of a, a specific action or outreach towards other people. Let me get turning back to 2 Samuel, if you would. 2 Samuel. Turning to verse or chapter 9. I want to read a story about a, a man named Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan, who of course was the son of Saul. So this is Saul's grandson. Jonathan was David's best friend. David, you might say, had a, a love-hate relationship with Saul. David tried to love Saul, and Saul hated his guts. <laughs> but you know, David respected Saul. We talked about that in the Bible study on Wednesday night. So with that as a little bit of a background on Mephibosheth, let's read 2 Samuel 9, verse 1. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. So David thought about Saul. He said, okay, it's the previous king. That was God's anointed. You know, David understood and respected that. And he said, Jonathan, you know, good friend of mine, is there anything that I can do to help that family out? Verse 2, it says, And there was a servant in the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. And the king said, is there uh, not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? Ziba goes on and tells a story about Mephibosheth. I won't read for the sake of time. But David showed kindness to Mephibosheth, who, by the way, had his, his, he couldn't walk because of a, an injury uh, that was sustained when he was five years old. Again, we won't go into that whole story right now. But he shows him the kindness and says, you know what, we're going to set a permanent place from Mephibosheth, easy for you to say, Mephibosheth, at the king's table. In other words, I want to provide for this person. I want to provide him food. You know, he would have had a place in the king's court. That was a specific act of kindness. You talk about sometimes we hear things and we teach our, our children to perform random acts of kindness. And that's a good thing to, to teach our, our kids. Uh, and this wasn't maybe necessarily a random act since David knew Jonathan, a new Saul. But it was an act of kindness. David didn't owe Mephibosheth anything. But he said, here's an act of kindness that in my position, in my power, I can do. I can do. Let's read about a similar example of God's kindness over in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2. We'll pick it up in verse 4. Ephesians 2, verse 4. says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved, and raised us together, and made us together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God extended a kindness, a specific action towards us, by giving his son, his son's life, so that we could have eternal life. Calling that a kindness is an understatement of the greatest degree. But it is a kindness, it's a specific action. God extended that kindness to us. He didn't owe us anything. And if you continue reading through the section of Scripture, we understand we can't earn salvation. It's by grace we're saved. Kindness then can be thought of as an action. Helping a little old lady across the street 
giving a child an extra cookie uh, at, at snack time just because, you know, they were really behaving well that day. Slowing down to allow someone in traffic. You don't owe them that. But those are actions that we can extend through kindness. We're not required to do any of those things, but by doing them, we can be more like our Heavenly Father and have the character of both God and Jesus. Next up is goodness. Goodness. If kindness is a specific action, goodness is the reason for it. If kindness is a specific action, goodness is the reason behind it. You might describe a, a car or your dog as a, a good car or a good dog. Maybe not for any specific reason, but in general, the car has been reliable, hasn't caused you a lot of trouble. The dog doesn't bark a lot, always goes to the door when it needs to go to the bathroom, those sorts of things. It's a good car. It's a good dog. In this way, you might think of goodness as reputation as reputation, what you know someone or something for. Let's turn to Psalm 107. Psalm 107. Oops. Psalm 107. We're going to pick it up in verse 8. Psalm 107, verse 8. Psalm 107 verse 8 says, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for the wonderful works to the children of men. Think about that hymn. Oh, that men would praise their God for, you know, for all that he does for the sons of men. Now, the actions, the things he does for us, that's God acting out of kindness. <laughs> Why does he do it? Because he's good. Because he is good. Because of his goodness, he acts kindly towards us. Another way to think about it, sometimes it's easier to define what things are by looking at what they are not. Let's turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And we'll read in verse 9. Romans 12, 9 says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Abhor evil, cling to good. The implication is that these two things are opposite. That they're opposite. Similarly, if we skip on down to verse 21, it says, Do not overcome, or excuse me, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's the antidote, you might say. You've heard the saying, you've probably seen it. You go into a restaurant and they have a, this, the, the shop out front where they sell you like the, all the signs that you hang up in your living room in the bathroom. It says, God is good all the time. God is good. God is good. There's no scripture that actually says those exact words, by the way, at least not in any conventional translations. God is good. But more than that, God defines what is good. God defines goodness. We won't turn there, but consider in Genesis 1 when God looked down and he said the creation, he said, this is good. Now understand Humankind's done a lot to corrupt it over the past 6,000 years or so. But this creation, it was good. In Genesis 3, <clears throat> Eve was told she would be like God, knowing good and evil. And more to the point, as was again sort of touched on in the sermonette, you could decide what's good and evil. That's the big lie. That was the big lie. Not about dying. <laughs> the big lie was you can decide what's good and evil. You can be and give the definition of good. God alone defines what goodness is. We could go on all day 
talking about how God is good and how he defines it. But suffice it to say that God does define what is good. Let's focus now on what we can do and our aspect of having more of that goodness in our character. Let's turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I'm going fairly quickly through a lot of these. We are, as I mentioned, going to go through these rapid fire. Uh, good Lord willing, the crick don't rise. <laughs> this sermon is uh, being recorded and uh, everything will be posted later on, so you always go back and listen to it later. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, Paul's giving a, a section of general admonition here. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21 says, Test all things, hold fast to what is good. Now, uh, again, I, I kind of go back in my manufacturing days. Right At the end of any manufacturing process, at the end, there was almost always a quality check. You know, it might be a part has to be so long, or a certain flow rate, it's got to do X, Y, Z. It could be a visual check. What do you do with the bad ones? Toss them in a scrap pile. What do you do with the good ones? You hold on to those. We need to be discerning about what we do. We need to be discerning about what's good. When we look at something to decide if it's good or not, what standard do we use? Well, it's good to worship God. Whatever day of the week motivates you to worship God, worship Him. Well, now, wait a minute. <laughs> I read through this and it says we're to gather and worship on the Sabbath. So we should honor and respect and glorify God every day, of course. And in that respect, worshiping. But the day that God defines as the day to worship is the Sabbath. That's an easy one. We can see that. We all understand that. We wouldn't be here today together if we didn't believe and know and understand that. Here's a harder one. What should I wear to church on Sabbath services? Should I wear a miniskirt and a crop top? You do not want to see me wearing that. <laughs> should I wear jeans that are all cut up in an old dirty t-shirt? No. The Bible says something about coming before God. It says something about putting our best forward. It doesn't say thou shalt wear a suit and tie to church. But it says, you know what, you need to think before you go before your creator. So you need to give some thought to that. It's good that we do that. Here's an even harder one. What do I allow in my mind every day? TV, radio, internet. Do I just open the floodgates wide and let any old thing flood into my face and my eyes and my ears? Do I practice discernment and say, mm, this isn't good? This isn't good. By thinking about the character quality of God's goodness, we can think about what, in fact, is good and not evil. And we can have a direct impact on how we live, how we behave, and how much our character matches that of God and Jesus Christ. Next up is faithfulness. Think about faithfulness for a minute. We must distinguish faithfulness from faith. Faith, generally speaking, that's our belief in God. Others would define it maybe as what your beliefs are, but by and large, faith means that we do believe in God. We do believe what he says. We do honor and worship him and do the things he says because we have faith that his word is true. Faithfulness has to do more with sticking to it. Sticking to what it is we believe. Let's look at one example of how God is faithful to us. 1 John 1, verse 9. 1 John 1, verse 1 John 1 and verse 9 <clears throat> says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is just one example of how God is faithful to us. 
We read elsewhere he's faithful to heal us, sometimes in a physical sense, right now in this life. But if not then, in the future when we have a spirit body. He's faithful to encourage and strengthen us when we ask him and allow him to. He's faithful to share what his will is in our lives when we study his word and allow ourselves to be led, guided, and directed by his spirit. But the faithfulness to forgive our sin, I submit to you, is greater than all of these. Because if God is not faithful to forgive our sins, nothing else matters. If God is not faithful to forgive our sins, all the understanding, all the encouragement, all the healing of our physical bodies in the world really doesn't matter. This scripture, I've got it written in the margin of my Bible, and I I certainly encourage you to do the same. This is one of the biggest promises that God makes us. This is a huge promise of God, that he is faithful to forgive. We don't have to worry about God being faithful. We understand and know that. But we do need to think about how you and I can and should be faithful. And we can be faithful in lots of different ways. How we care for one another. You know, uh, paying our tithes, uh, obedience to God's commands, all those sorts of things. Let's just look at one act of faithfulness that we see if we continue reading right here. Verse 10, it says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. What's it mean if we do say we've sinned, a.k.a. what does it mean if we repent? If we repent, we are faithful. We can show faithfulness to God by repentance. Now I'm not talking about re-repenting for you know, something that you did 25 years ago and you've repented of it. <laughs> you know. But repentance as an ongoing mindset. We need to be faithful to be looking at ourselves, to constantly examine ourselves. Where can I do better? What should I say? What should I not say? What should I do? What should I not do? None of us can say we're without sin. Now hopefully we have less sin than what we did 10 years ago. None of us can say we're without sin though, so we must be faithful amongst other things to continually be repentant to God, to look for ways to overcome to ask for forgiveness. That's one example of faithfulness. Next up is gentleness. Gentleness. Like kindness and goodness, this can somewhat get lost in the shuffle, I think, a little bit as you know, nice, pleasant sounding words. If kindness, we said, is a something that's demonstrated through a specific action, and goodness is the reason behind doing that action, and I think gentleness speaks to the demeanor of carrying out that action. Proverbs 15, verse 1. Proverbs 15, verse 1. You probably know this one by heart. Proverbs 15, verse 1. It says, A soft answer turns away wrath, But a harsh word stirs up anger. The word here they use is soft, but it refers to the demeanor and how we might answer a question. We don't give an answer that obscures the truth. Someone asks us why we don't keep Christmas. We don't just say, ah, I just don't do it. I'm not into commercialism. I mean, those things may be true, but is that the real reason? Is that why you don't keep Christmas? Obviously, we have to be discerning and when we're giving answers and how we give them. Someone really wanting to know? Or is it just a casual conversation? We heard about that a, a few weeks back. But it speaks to our gentleness. It points to the fact it's not necessarily what we say at times. It's how we say it. 
Women without men are nothing. And before you get your axes and staves, let me say that one more time. Women without men are nothing. Exact same words. Said a much, much different way. There is something to how we say what we say. Consider Jesus' example in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. This was, relatively speaking, fairly early in Jesus' ministry. Matthew 9, verse 10 says, Now it happened, as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Somebody questioned Jesus, said, why are you eating with these bunch of sinners? Jesus could very rightfully have said, you ain't no better than they are. He didn't answer it that way, though. He gave an answer that provoked thought. He gave a gentle answer. He didn't say, y'all a bunch of two-faced hypocrites. Now, there was times later in his ministry, after the Pharisees specifically (laughs) refused to answer and listen, that Jesus did get stronger with his answer. But you see, if you read through the gospel, Jesus Christ gave gentle answers and only gave difficult answers to those who were unwilling to listen. At the end of his ministry, even, we see a very gentle answer. Matthew 26. We'll stay just in the book of Matthew here and go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. This is, again, near the very end of Jesus Christ's life. Matthew 26, verse 48. It says, Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss... He is that one, sees him. So Judas had worked out this sign. says, I want to go up and and betray Jesus Christ by giving him a kiss. That way you'll know who to arrest, right? says, immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Jesus gave a gentle answer. He didn't stir up strife. He practiced for Proverbs 15, verse 1. Perfectly. He gave a soft answer to try to avoid conflict, and we know there was some conflict here because quick draw McGraw, McGraw, Peter, (laughs) was ready to whip out his sword. But then Jesus tried to practice gentleness here. How can we practice the gentleness of Jesus Christ? I'd like to give you the following example of a scenario. You have some property, say, on a, on a, a lakefront, okay? There's an old widow lady who has family on the other side of the property. She would like to be reunited with them, but she can't get across the lake, okay? You have the feeling in you that says, you know what? I want to help this lady. That's goodness. You say, you know what? I'm willing to get in my boat and take her across. That's kindness. That's specific action. So what's gentleness? Well, to get there, you've got two options. you got your 500-horsepower speedboat that'll get you there in about two minutes and probably shake the old lady's dentures straight out of her head. (laughs) Or you got your rowboat that it's going to take you longer to paddle across that lake hour there, an hour back. How you practice that kindness then is gentleness, is gentleness. The point is this, don't let the kindness of an action or the goodness that drives it be undone with words or with actions that aren't gentle. Gentle. 
Don't let the kindness of an action or the goodness that drives it be undone with words or actions that are not gentle. This brings us to self-control. Self-control, as you've probably heard and no doubt experienced, the first eight aspects of the fruit of the Spirit are cakewalk, if you have this one down. If you have self-control, the rest are easy. If you can master this one to control all your thoughts, your actions, then being loving, peaceable, joyful, faithful is easy. Without self-control, it gets a lot, lot harder, doesn't it, to have godly character. Keep your finger here in Matthew. We're going to come back here in just a moment. Well, let's look to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4 for a definition of self-control. I remember as a young man hearing this in a sermon, and it, it rang out to me then, it rings out to me now when I think about self-control. And I think about my lack thereof at times. Genesis chapter 4. Verse 6, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? Cain was upset about the fact that his offering was respected, or his offering was not respected, and and Abel's was. He says, why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. God says to Cain, says sin is going to be there. It's at the door. It's always waiting. Never, ever a day that goes by where something isn't just ready to jump out there and snatch away from us peace or a kind action or an opportunity to be more faithful to God. Those things are always there. He said, but we have to roll over it. We have to rule over it. When it comes down to it, self-control is simply ruling over sin. Whether it's to kill someone, (laughs) to commit adultery, to maybe let an act of kindness slide by without practicing it. A desire to stray from God's goodness or use our own definition for what's good. If we go back to Matthew 26 here, we read about a great example of Christ's self-control. We, we talked about this the other day. But we're just going to pick up right where we left on a minute ago. Jesus said to him in verse 50, Matthew 26, verse 50, says, Friend, why have you come? They came and laid hands on Jesus and took him, and suddenly one of those that was with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew a sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? Christ goes on and says, This is all part of the plan. Scripture is being fulfilled. Do you have the self-control it takes? (laughs) If you could pray to God right now for a legion of angels to come down and... You know, fill in the blank. Lower gas prices. <laughs> Whatever it is that really aggravates you. It's a good thing that I don't have the ability to pull down a legion of angels because there would be a path of destruction in my trail. I don't have the kind of self-control, the self-restraint that Jesus shows, the spiritual maturity that he possesses. So How? Can we exhibit self-control? I did a little research on this. There's dozens and dozens of books out there that give you all sorts of advice. One of the things that it says is envision the end goal. Envision the end goal. What is it you really want from a situation? What is it that you really want out of life? 
Envision that end goal. Think about this and keep the thought of the end goal in the back of your mind. Think about this over in James chapter 3. James chapter 3. James chapter 3, verse 4 says, Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. Lynn Martin, who's the chairman of the Council of Elders and a good friend of mine, Uh, pastors of Columbus congregation, gave a sermon on this, and I wrote it down on my margin. It says, the tongue is like a fire. It can warm your house or burn it down. (laughs) The tongue is like a fire. It can warm your house or it can burn it down. It's been said the world would be a more peaceful place if everybody just kept their mouth shut. (laughs) I think that's true. We all have experienced that thing, or if at least in practice what we read in Proverbs 15, verse 1. And perhaps give a soft answer. So how can we have mastery over our words and over our desires, the desires of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, those things that lead us to sin? Let's think about that concept we spoke about, keeping the end prize in mind. What is it that our goal really is in this life? Think about that and let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we're going to read just the closing few verses here, starting in verse 24. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, it says, Do you not know that those who run a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Now, the prize we seek is what? kingdom of God. Now, fortunately, it's not like any foot race. It's not just the first one that gets there that's going to win it. There's going to be lots of winners in that respect. It says, everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus. Paul says, here's how I run. Okay, here's my philosophy, if you will. It says, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, you know, not a shadow boxer, he says, I, I, I think about it more seriously than that. He said, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now, Paul was a preacher of the gospel. He brought the gospel thousands in his time. His words today we learn from, they're good for us. So much of what we think about in terms of Christian living come from the works that Paul wrote, inspired by God, of course. But he says, you know what? He said, lest I lose that crown, become disqualified myself, he said, I discipline my body, my mind, my tongue. Paul recognized, you know what? I need self-control. He looked at the big picture and said, you know, if I don't have self-control, I'm giving up an awful, awful lot. There's other ways that we could practice self-control, I'm sure, and things to think about. Certainly, again, each of these aspects of God's character, the fruit of the Spirit, we can pray for. But certainly when I think it comes to self-control, we should give time and think, as Paul did. What is it I'm really after? What is it I'm trying to obtain? If I lack self-control, might I disqualify myself from that reward? Something to think about. What is God like? What's his character? I think it's safe to say that his character matches the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace patience or long-suffering, 
kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. By thinking about these things individually and looking at examples of how God and Christ practice them, you and I can better see how to put on the character of God.